Texas. As if in legislative session, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.R. 6503, which was received from the House. <laughs> Further, that the bill be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there objection? Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Colorado. Thank you. Reserving the right to object, uh, Mr. President. Um, it's good to be here on the floor with my colleagues, and I actually wasn't going to talk about the FAA, but I, I came out here and I got accused by the senator from Texas of being irresponsible. And my friend Phil Washington, who was up for the FAA, was attacked for not knowing anything about airports. So I just want to address those two things before I go into my remarks. Uh, one, uh, to, to the gentleman from North Carolina, Phil Washington knows a considerable amount about transportation and aviation in this country. That was ignored by the senator from Texas. That's being ignored tonight, by the or this afternoon, the senator from North Carolina. He runs Denver International Airport. That's one of the largest airports in the United States of America. Uh, it's an airport that has been built more recently than any other airport in the United States of America. It has. It is the third largest traffic uh, in the world. It now uh, has the United Hub there. I was just talking to the President of the United yesterday, CEO. They have as more traffic coming through there than they do in Chicago. So for the record, let me just say, Phil Washington knows uh, a lot about this. And I'm sorry that his nomination didn't go forward. That's not why we're here today. Let me also say, since he called me irresponsible, that it is nice to hear the Senator of Texas come out here and plead for some regular order in terms of how our government should work, to worry about the fact that um, people could be furloughed or, or laid off, that they are uh, uncertain of the future because uh, the bill is not permanent. These were all concerns he did not have the last time we were on the floor together when he had shut the government down while Colorado was literally underwater because of floods. When we were out here having that crocodile tear speech the last time, and I'm glad that, you know, he's reconsidered all of that. And that he wants the FAA to, to run in a, in a proper fashion. But I don't think it is irresponsible for me to be here today to object, Mr. President, and I will object to this request because I think it is critically important for us to use this moment to fulfill our obligations in the world to the United States national security and to our commitment to democracy, both here and throughout the Western world. The Ukrainian people were invaded two years ago by Vladimir Putin. They didn't ask for that. By a tyrant. They did not ask for that. The intelligence agencies told us that Kyiv would be taken in 72 hours. That's what they said it would take. My colleague from the Intelligence Committee is here on the floor, and he knows that. They were told that Putin would be able to install a puppet government in Ukraine and be able to dictate the future of the American people, to be able to keep Ukraine from being part of the West. Well, as sometimes happens in human history, they were completely wrong. They were completely wrong. The Ukrainian people, much to the surprise of the entire world, because of their courage, because of their bravery, because of our support, both our intelligence support and the armaments that we've been able to ship them, which, by the way, have allowed us to restart our own national security efforts, because we're building those weapon systems here in 38 states. The Ukrainian people have taken back half the territory that Putin took from them. Nobody would have ever believed that. The Ukrainian people and their military 
have pushed Putin's navy out of the North Sea, out of the Black Sea, without even having a navy. They have no navy. And they are, those guys are so unbelievable that they've taken the tools that, that they have created and that we have given them to push Putin out of the Black Sea and to reopen those incredibly important grain shipments to the rest of the world to keep the rest of the world in this war. They have won battle after battle after battle. I hear people around here, it's so tiresome. say that the stalemate on the front lines between Zelensky and Putin, between Ukraine and the Russian troops, is somehow a failure, is somehow a failure for Ukraine on their part. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is a miracle. Actually, it's not a miracle because they did it through their blood, sweat, and tears. It is a testament to the sacrifice that the Ukrainian people have gone through, to what their troops have gone through, to the number of Russian troops and Russian mil uh, artillery that they've taken off the battlefield, that they have created a stalemate in this war. I'm not here. That's not an admission of failure. That's an admission of success. And what we are trying to figure out today, whether when we go into this long winter, when Putin is on television today saying that the Ukrainians are out of bullets, that the United States is going to stop funding the Ukrainian people, telling the Western world, the free world, that has been so inspired by what the Ukrainian people have done, so inspired by their courage and their bravery, that they've come together with the leadership of the United States to strengthen, strengthen NATO in ways nobody could have imagined, and to have free citizens all over the world say to people like the senator from Texas and me, do more, do more, do more. And that's what they're doing during this Christmas season. They're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for democracy. They don't get to say, okay, it's time to go home 11 days before Christmas has happened. And their fight is our fight. Their fight is our fight. You know, um, Madam President, I held up the uh, the budget bill a few months. By the way, it's very nice to see the president in the chair. I've never seen you up there. It's good to see you up there. I, I held the budget bill several months ago on this floor because it had no funding for Ukraine, even though we said that we would fund Ukraine uh, because there was no plan to get it funded. On the single most important thing that we have in front of the world, not just the Senate of the United States, we had no plan to fund Ukraine, and I thought that was a lousy message to send, and it was a lousy message to send. We left here without funding it, and actually it turned out we left here without a Speaker of the House. We left here with bright lights flashing on the institutional incompetence of our own democracy, which, by the way, that's not a great look for the United States of America. And what happened? We left, and a death cult called Hamas killed 1,400 Israelis while we were gone. And now we have a war going on in the Middle East. The world is an unpredictable place, Madam President. I am encouraged because a few days ago, it looked to me like this deal was dead. A few days ago, I was facing the prospect of calling up my mom 
who was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1938, who's still alive, the worst moment probably in human history to be born Jewish in, and the worst place on the planet to be born in the, when she was born, who can't believe she's lived long enough, thank God she has lived long enough, but she would say, I can't believe I've lived long enough to see another land war break out in Europe. But she has, and it happened. And I thought I was going to have to be in a position of saying to my mother, we haven't learned anything from history. We haven't learned anything about the 16 million people that were killed in the years after she was born, just in, just in Poland and just in Ukraine, just in those two countries by Hitler and by Stalin. We haven't learned anything. We're too tired. We're too busy. We're too distracted by the other stuff that's going on in the United States of America to actually do our work, which, by the way, no other country in the world can do. There is no other country in the world that can turn on the leadership that we can provide. There's no other country in the world that can provide the munitions we are Providing, I want to say again to the American people that virtually 90% of the armaments that we are sending to Ukraine are being made here in the United States of America, 38 states. Colorado is not one of them, putting people to work all over the United States, driving incomes up, but also more important than that, making us ready in a world where Hamas has attacked Israel, where Putin has invaded Ukraine, where she is watching every single day whether we are going to turn our backs on our allies in the free world who have done everything that anybody here could have asked for. In fact, nobody would have ever asked for it because nobody here would have believed it was possible. No one would have believed it was possible. And for what, by the way? Zelensky told us the first Zoom call that we had with him, President Zelensky, just so we could live our lives the way you live your lives. He said the other day in front of the, the, the Democrats and Republicans who came to see him when he was here that we would, he thought he could win if we continued to supply him. Uh, but that he would lose if we didn't continue to supply him. But he said, either way, we're going to fight to the death. Either way, with your help or without your help. One way we'll be successful, the other way we're going to lose. But what he said, he said the reason why we're going to do that is because the Ukrainian people love freedom. Because the Ukrainian people want to live their lives the way you live your life. I mention the Middle East every day, and I hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle say every single day, Iran is now attacking our troops in Iraq. The Houthis are sending their missiles to, uh, uh, to uh, attack shipping uh, around Israel and around the Middle East. There are flashing red lights going on all over the Middle East, and the Israelis have to worry about another front opening up here. And then finally, of course, China is watching what we're doing as well. Now, Madam President, I, I would never have attached these border issues to the Ukraine bill. I would never have attached these immigration issues to the Ukraine bill. But some Republican colleagues have done it because they've said, this is an important bill. We're going to use this to lever you know, our concerns about immigration or the border. I've got a lot of concerns about a lot of things. I think our education system doesn't work well for poor kids in this country at all. I think our health care system doesn't work well for the American people. But I'm not attaching those to this, this piece of business. But I have heard Republicans who support Ukraine who have said they need to do this in order for us to have a bipartisan bill. 
And I have heard the President of the United States say our immigration system is broken. I've heard the Homeland Security Advisor, the, Homeland Sec the Secretary of Homeland Security say the same thing. And I will tell you, I think the American people do not want an immigration system that is run by transnational smuggling rings, transnational gangs that are sending people to the border of the United States at record numbers. I don't think the American people want that. And so if there is a way for us to have a negotiation here that can get us to a good result for the American people on immigration and on the border, and that's the price that people have said they're going to insist on, I've been willing to have that discussion, and I will be willing to have that discussion. It's one of the other reasons why I think we shouldn't leave. But as I said a few days ago, we were making no progress. Now, finally, we are making some progress, and the world is watching what we do here. And we can't fail. And given how screwed up American politics can be, It can make you wonder whether we ought to take an extra day or a day after that or an extra few days or whether they ought to just stay here and do the work or whether we ought to move on to other things like the FAA bill before, we, before we're done. I know I've tested your patience and I've tested the patience of the Senator from Texas, I'm sure, this afternoon. And I'm, I'm going to stop, but I want to finish by saying at least speaking for myself, I don't think there is anything that anybody who is here will ever do in the in this Senate that's going to be more important than the vote we're going to take on additional funding for Ukraine. I think we are going to either establish or reestablish America's very special place in this world and our leadership of free countries and democracies around the world, or we are going to squander that in the face of what Putin is already telling us he's going to do, in the face of what the Iranians are already doing to our, to our soldiers who are in the Middle East and in the face of what Xi Jinping is thinking about with respect to Taiwan. The authoritarian leaders in this world think they have a better way of running the, uh, human affairs than democracy. I, don't, I think they're wrong. And when the Ukrainian people have fought as hard as they have for the last two years, and eclipse any expectation that anybody could have had for them, the least we can do is continue our, and continue our support. Finally, let me say as I, as I close, Madam President, that it is going to be really important for us to get back to a place where we can have a bipartisan discussion about how to create a functional immigration system in America. Now, I'm not just talking about the border. Immigration has been a fundamentally important part of our country's history, and it will be a fundamentally important part of our country's future. It is a massive advantage that the United States has over the other, other countries around the world when it's working well. And there are people all over the world that want to be here. No one is crossing the Gobi Desert to get into Beijing, and we should be happy about that. They want to come here. And one of the highlights of my life has been, you know, in 2013 when I was part of the Gang of Eight here that negotiated an immigration bill that had a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million people that were undocumented. It had the most progressive Dream Act that had ever been written. It had all the visa stuff for, for farmers and ranchers and for business people. It had $40 billion of border security in it. Uh, to, to, to strengthen our southern border and be able to say to the American people that we're doing, taking that seriously. And unfortunately, it didn't pass. And times have changed since then.
you know, the gangs, these transnational gangs have made it their business to make billions of dollars sending people to the southern border every single day. And we have to take notice of that. And we're going to have to adjust. But I hope that doesn't mean that there won't be a day that comes back when we have the chance to do it in a bipartisan way. And in the meantime, we've got to get our work done on Ukraine. In the meantime, we shouldn't leave. In the meantime, I don't think we should move on to other pieces of legislation. And for all those reasons, Madam President, I object. Objection is heard. Madam President. Senator from Texas. Madam President, early in his remarks, the Senator from Colorado said the last time he and I were on this floor debating, it was when I had shut down the government and he was stepping forward to save those who had been shut down. Now, that would be entirely accurate uh, if my name were Chuck Schumer. But since it's not, what the Senator from Colorado said is blatantly, objectively false. The last time he and I were doing this, the date was January 24, 2019. We were in the midst of the Schumer shutdown. Chuck Schumer and the Democrats had forced a shutdown. The government was shut down. And there was a particularly unfair aspect of that shutdown, which is that Congress had voted to fund the military, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. But the Coast Guards had been left out. Because the Coast Guards are not in DOD, they'd been left out. And on January 24th, 2019, Senator Sullivan and I came down to this floor to seek equity for the Coast Guards, to simply say, pay our Coast Guardsmen the same as our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And the Senator from Colorado stood up and objected. So understand, what he just said is exactly opposite what was happening. Our Coast Guardsmen went weeks in 2019 without being paid during that shutdown because the senator from Colorado objected to their getting a paycheck. And during his remarks on that day, he jumped up and down and screamed at me and insulted me to great fanfare. And I think he was proud of his performance because he then put it in his launch emails for his presidential campaign that I screamed at Cruz. Now, I suppose I should feel mildly offended that that was not a persuasive argument in the Democrat primary, and he got maybe a percent. That was the last context. Shutting down the Coast Guard, where the senator, senator from Colorado was responsible for tens of thousands of Coast Guardsmen not getting their paycheck. Understand where we are today. Today, the question is, does the FAA stay open or not? And once again, the senator from Colorado is the shutdown senator. The FAA extension would pass had he not said those two words, I object. Now, we heard from the senator from Colorado a long discourse on Ukraine. You know, remarkably missing from that discourse was acknowledgement that responsibility for the war in Ukraine falls very directly on the Biden White House, on Senate Democrats, and on the senator from Colorado in particular, who played a direct role in causing the war in Ukraine. Now, how is that? Putin did not wake up yesterday wanting to invade Ukraine. He's wanted to invade Ukraine for years. He did so in the year 2014. He invaded Crimea, the southern portion of Ukraine. But he stopped. He did not go into the full country. Why? because Russia's major source of revenue is selling oil and gas, and the natural gas pipelines run right through the middle of Ukraine. He could not risk damaging or destroying those pipelines. So in 2015, Vladimir Putin began what is known as Nord Stream 2, an undersea pipeline from Russia to Germany, the entire purpose of which was to circumvent Ukraine so once it was built and operational, he could invade Ukraine. In 2019, I authored legislation, sanctions legislation, to shut down the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That sanctions legislation got overwhelming bipartisan support, including from the senator from Colorado. It passed, and Putin shut down building the Nord Stream 2 pipeline literally the day President Trump signed my sanctions legislation into law. 
In December of 2020, I again authored bipartisan legislation putting more sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Once again, the senator from Colorado and every Democrat supported it. It passed and was signed into law. Joe Biden became president January 20th, 2021. Four days later, on January 24th, Putin resumed deep sea construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Four days later. Why? Because Biden had telegraphed weakness. He had told Putin, I'm going to go soft on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And what he telegraphed was accurate. Because several months later, Biden formally waived sanctions on Nord Stream 2. He gave a multi-billion dollar gift to Putin and allowed him to complete the pipeline. Now, in January of 2022, I forced another vote on the Senate floor, a vote to reimpose sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The senator from Colorado just invoked President Zelensky. Oddly enough, he didn't seem to care what President Zelensky thought in January of 2022. Because President Zelensky in January of 2022 begged the United States Senate, please pass Cruz's sanctions legislation. It is the last best hope to stop Russia from invading Ukraine. The government of Poland put out a formal statement saying, please pass Cruz's sanctions. If you do not, Putin will invade Ukraine. On the day of the vote, Joe Biden came to Capitol Hill. He came to meet with the Senate Democrats. It was the first time in his presidency he had done that. And he asked them as a personal favor, will you stand with the Biden White House? Will you stand with Russia? Will you stand with Putin? Will you vote to give billions of dollars to Putin? And I'm sorry to say 44 Democrats flipped their votes. On the day of the vote, I stood here on the floor and said, if you vote no, we will see Russian tanks in the streets of Kyiv. But 44 Democrats flipped their votes and decided partisan loyalty to the White House mattered more than Ukraine, mattered more than stopping Russia. And just four weeks later, the Russian tanks rolled in. And the senator from Colorado was one of those 44 votes who voted for Russia and Putin on the eve of the war. And if you don't believe me, go look at what Zelensky said in January of 2022. If you vote no, Russia will invade. Now, I don't doubt that the senator from Colorado today has genuine and good faith concern for the people of Ukraine. That is admirable. But understand what he's doing here. He's not doing anything related to Ukraine. He is holding the American flying public hostage. He is saying, because he's mad about what's happening on Ukraine funding, he wants to shut the FAA down. He wants to shut jobs down in the Denver airport. And I would just urge the senator from Colorado to listen to a very, very wise senator from this body. And I will read a quote. The quote is as follows. Politics, holding up FAA extension, costing Colorado jobs. Hashtag, FAA shutdown. Now, the author of that tweet, that would be Senator Michael Bennett. He sent that tweet on August 4th, 2011, the last time we had an FAA shutdown. And I would say that Senator Bennett, I suspect, might not recognize the senator today. But I would urge listening to the 2011 senator who understood shutting the FAA down is bad for Colorado and it's bad for the country. And so I would urge the senator from Colorado, if you are unhappy about Ukraine funding, don't hold the flying public hostage because of it. Madam President. Madam President. Senator from Colorado. I, th I thank the, the senator from Texas. It's actually, it's fun to remember all of this. And, and I'm sorry, I don't have a phone on my desk, so I, nobody can send me my, my prior quotes and, or your prior quotes. I wish they... I wish we, I had thought to do that, um, but I have a pretty good memory, and I just, just so the facts are on the floor, the facts are the facts. When we were out here in 2019, by the way, and I would never confuse, I should say, the senator for, um, from Texas with uh, Senator Schumer, so let's establish that at the outset. I know you're two different people, you're very different people. 
When we were out here in 2019, though, what I was talking about was I was reminding people of the shutdown that you led in 2013 while Colorado was underwater. While there were cities and towns all over our state who had been crushed by uh, the floodwaters that had, that had started in these unexpected storms and come rushing through these mountain valleys and ended up destroying towns and villages that looked like bombs had gone off there. And the people in Colorado were digging themselves out. There were people, local elected officials, Democrats and Republicans who were doing the work they, they needed to do. And the federal government was shut down because of Senator Cruz from Texas. That is what happened. Those people are owed an apology for what the senator of Texas did. And then he came out here in 2019 pretending that he cared about trying to resolve, by the way, it wasn't Chuck Schumer's shutdown. It was Donald Trump's shutdown. He was the president. It was the longest shutdown in American history. And I don't have my phone to tell me this, but if you look it up, please do, you will find that it was the Trump shutdown not the Schumer shutdown. And it went on forever. Not forever, but it was the longest shutdown ever. And, and Senator Cruz was coming out here with these Potemkin pieces of legislation to, 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 to sort of trick Democrats or, or to force Democrats into taking a bad vote on you know, the funding of the Coast Guard while the whole rest of the government was shut down. He might have believed that the most important thing to do at that moment, I suppose, was to fund the Coast Guard and to leave every, everything else shut down. I suppose that's possible. I suspect a likelier reason was that he was trying to create a vote that said the Democrats are for, for shutting the government down or shutting the Coast Guard down, not shutting the government down. Donald Trump had shut the government down, President Trump. And that's what we were out here discussing. So you give me the opportunity to remind everyone of the 2013 uh, events, and, uh, and, I, and I, I won't withdraw what I said on, on 2019. I will say that I want to thank the senator from Texas for remembering that I even had a presidential campaign at all. It's not a well-remembered event in uh, the history of our democracy. I'm grateful that he could have played a role in trying to get me off the ground, and, um, and we'll have to see. But that was not the great, as I've said to people, well, I won't go on for, I'll say the senator from Texas that uh, when I got in, even my mom said, do we need one more Democrat in this race, Michael? So that was how I started that race. Uh, and then I'll say finally that, um, that the FAA doesn't end up uh, expiring until the 31st of this month. And we have time in front of us to do the work that needs to be done. I want to congratulate the senator from Texas for the work that he did on the Nord Stream pipeline. I think that was meaningful work. And I remember you standing out here uh, at a time when a lot of other people didn't even know what you were talking about uh, and having you stand here and make that case. And I give you that for sure. And I would say also that I'm sure you feel passionately that the position that you took before Putin invaded Ukraine um, might have had some effect on, on what he did. We have a disagreement about that, but that's okay. Neither of us can change what's happened in the past. But what we can do is make sure that we recognize that this tyrant has invaded Ukraine, that this tyrant has done something that is in contravention of the civil order since World War II, since my mom was born in Poland in 1938, that the world has come together to support the free people of Ukraine in their battle, that Putin's only allies in this battle today are North Korea and Iran and sort of China, who are kind of 
watching how this all unfolds. So the question before us now is not, I don't think, did we have some vote on the Senate that went one way or another? And I'm sorry, John, or the Senator from Wyoming, I'll stop. Went from some way or another, or if, or that Democrats, or that Joe Biden somehow is responsible for Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. First of all, that's certainly not true, even if we have disagreements about what was going on here. But what is certainly true is that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. He decided to invade Ukraine. The Ukrainian people have exposed the weakness of Putin's army. They've exposed the weakness of his leadership. They've exposed the weakness of his strategy. They've exposed the strength of NATO. They've exposed the importance of American leadership. They have given us the chance to rearm the American people. They have pushed back Xi Jinping. That's not bad for two years of work. And we should not go home. We should stay here and do the work we need to do to support Ukraine. Madam President, I yield the floor.